Okay. You ready to record? Okay. Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. Okay, uh, so uh, hello folks. I am uh, Scott M. Jones. I am uh, director of the Electronic Frontiers Forums track at Dragon Con. And before we get started this year, uh, our designated charity is Cure Childhood Cancer. Uh, Cure's impact over the last 12 years, $38 million invested in promising research studies that are saving lives. If you would like to donate to the ch uh, Children's uh, Cancer Charity, uh, we'd ask that you put some spare change in or maybe a little bit more. And uh, if you prefer to donate um, by credit card, you can do that at the DragonCon store. So I'm gonna bring this around and then uh, we can get started. Uh, I don't think we have a moderator for this panel, so now we'll have to model through. Uh, I think if I had Michael, so I might be very quiet. Right now. Can I get the mic volume on this? Otherwise, I will just, there we go, okay. Um, I can project, and there's a link, yeah, it's not a, not a pack crowd. Um, so thanks for coming out for this lovely 10 a.m. Monday panel. Uh, my name is Meredith Rose. I am the senior policy counsel at a group called Public Knowledge. We are a Washington, D.C.-based consumer advocacy group, and we work on a whole panoply of tech issues, uh, from competition and antitrust, to net neutrality, to wireless spectrum licensing, to intellectual property, to Section 230, and that is, in theory, uh, why uh, we are here to talk about Gonzales v. Google. Hi, I'm Heidi Tandy. I know half of you. I have known half of you for over 25 years. Um, and I am an attorney with the law firm of Berger Singerman in South Florida. And I have been doing terms of use and privacy policy law since 1994. There are some people who've done more. Nobody who's currently doing it has done it longer. Um, it's been a sort of series of adventures with regard to privacy and terms of use issues going back four decades. Oh, now I know more than half of you. Um, and I'm going to be giving a little bit of historical perspective on why Section 230 exists, what it's done through the ages, and what we hope it will continue to do going forward into the future. Why don't we start with that, actually? Why don't we start with the historical perspective before we get to the cases at issue. So we can pull the historical perspective directly from the EFF website, which is an archive of um, internet history in some really charming ways. So how many of you participated in the Blue Ribbon campaign in 1996 and or made your website go black in 1996 when the Communications Decency Act was posted? Um, I don't know about you guys, but I use ASCII text to make a ribbon on my SIG file for my emails on Chris.com, which was concentric.network, which was one of the earlier available to the general public um, out of Washington, D.C. Um, email and website builders that you could utilize. I, at that point, was at the New York Times, who were both covering what was going on with the Communications Decency Act and protests about it, and also had major internal discussions about whether or not they should be participating by putting their very own blue ribbon on the front page. Um, at some moments it was there, and at some moments it wasn't. Let's just put it that way. Um, and. The reason for this is because the Communications Decency Act included a lot of things about um, that had they been found constitutional, spoiler, they were not. That was the ACLU versus Reno case. Um, then the internet would have been created for seven-year-olds from the very start and everything that we utilize and live with and have as a part of our daily lives would not exist. And yes, of course, there are people these days who don't remember history talking about how great it would be if the entire internet was geared for six to seven or maybe nine-year-olds. Um, there are other people who believe that 17-year-olds who have already started college should have access to the exact same internet as six, seven, and eight-year-olds. But at that point, there wasn't really any understanding of um, 
different ways that people might need to utilize the internet for different purposes. And a lot of content was static. We didn't have the kinds of databases that we do right now. We didn't have filtering systems. There was no way of either submitting a credit card to prove that you were over the age of 15, 17, 18, or at least had access to it. Um, and this was all also before the um, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act um, set the base age of 13 years old as the age at which you didn't need parental permission to access a lot of the internet. So we can go back to um, what the EFF was saying back in um, 1996. Um, from their, well, actually 1995, from the EFector newsletter. The number of people sending notes to the internet protest tally address is at least 14,000 and is probably going to get over 20,000. Um, now, given how many people are here at Dragon Con, we can think about you know the tiny amount of people that 14,000 or even 20,000 is participating in the protest. But at that point, given how many people or how few people were on the internet, that was actually a not insignificant percentage of people in the US who were using the internet. So um, at that point, there was a blackout established um, where basically people turned their websites to um, black text with a little bit, uh, or black um, backgrounds with a little bit of white text information as to why they were participating in this. Um, EFF had an informational page on their website talking about why they were doing this and why it was the largest organized protest on the internet. Um, Jerry Nadler was one of only 21 members of Congress to vote against the measure and called it the cyberspace equivalent of book burning and Al Gore, who of course was extremely involved in funding the early phases of the internet, said that while he thought that the, um, the Communications Decency Act and its elements, including Section 230, were important to have, the constitutionality of it would be decided by the Supreme Court, which of course it was. And how did that decision go? Oh. So um, basically that decision held that the Communications Decency Act was a major incursion on the First Amendment, could not be allowed to stand, and from, you know, in the past 25-ish years since then, Congress has not really tried to impose First Amendment rights on adults' use of the internet. Um, obviously, schools, um, especially elementary through high schools, can put whatever restrictions they want on people using their networks, whether it's Wi-Fi or um, whether it's wired in computers, because they're allowed to set that standard. Corporations can make decisions about what you're allowed to see and what you're not allowed to see, and block websites unless you get permission to see them, um, because that's what businesses are allowed to do. The government is even allowed to do that same sort of thing for its employees and its contractors. But making, and of course ISPs are allowed to do that because if you want to utilize a certain ISP um, that may um, block out unfamily friendly websites or something like that in order to use in your home, you're allowed to make that decision. But the government's not allowed to make that decision on a federal level. Right. Um, so the one part of the Communications Decency Act that was left standing by this. Uh, ironically, I think the only part of the CDA that was left standing was Section 230, uh, which everyone seems to have heard. Uh, it is only 26 words long. There is literally the definitive book about this. It's called The 26 Words That Created the Internet by Jeff Kossoff. Um, great book written by a very long-suffering guy um, who constantly, uh, during the heyday of uh, Twitter, rest in peace, uh, was constantly having to pop up and explain that that's not how 230 works. Um, so the, the very basic framework of Section 230 is that there are two real main uh, meaty bits of 230. Again, 26 words. It is not a lot. You can read it right now. Um, but to, CDA 230 does basically two things. Um, one, it says that if you are a, uh, a site or a platform that hosts user-generated content, you are not liable for what the users post on your website. Now there are some my, there are some restrictions on this that is not absolute for one thing. Um, you know, 
I think child pornography, there is still strict liability if that shows up on your website. Because there's uh, no First Amendment protection. Correct. So anything that doesn't have First Amendment protection is not protected under Section 230. And also explicitly carved out copyright law, because copyright is special. Um, copyright is just as important as fighting child pornography if you ask <laughs> copyright lobbyists. Um, actual thing that has been said to me. Um, and now we have SESTA FOSTA as well, and so there are some, some parts around the margins that have started to carve out this. But otherwise, the, the basic rule is that, uh, I think the way Kurt Opsahl likes to phrase it, is that the soapbox cannot be held responsible for the speaker that stands on top of it. Um, the other component of Section 230 is a provision uh, which basically says that the platform itself cannot be held liable for its content moderation decisions. So if it decides to remove something, that does not potentially create liability uh, for the platform coming from the person whose content was removed. Uh, everyone has issues with Section 230 uh, for various reasons. Um, now, the it, it is a weird time to be in DC to watch this because, as I've said this in a different panel, um, you see everyone seems to hate Section 230, and, and, and folks will yell about we need to reform 230, we need to fix 230. But if you actually drill down on the reasons why each side thinks that 230 needs to be reformed, generally, from the left, the uh, calls for reform come from uh, the fact that uh, these platforms have immunized um, for the acti from you know, being liable for the activity of their users, and that has allowed some particularly um, noxious areas of the internet to flourish. Like I have been on the I have been on the radar of kiwi farms. Like not a great place, not a not a great place to be. Um, and those kinds of like you know platforms were like coordinated mass harassment, swatting, um, falling disproportionately on marginalized communities. That's the complaint from the left. The complaint from the right tends to be. Actually, these platforms are taking down too much speech that I like. Mm -hmm. um, we're, they're censoring conservatives, mm -hmm. usually, is the way that this is framed. Um, and these how leftist dare tech you companies. Not, yeah, mm -hmm. How dare you not allow me to say that there is Ebola at Birmingham this weekend. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a right to, uh, specifically, not only do I have a right to speak, I have a right for everyone to have to hear me. Which you can actually, if you watch the, the current trajectory of X, nay, Twitter, that is very much where they're going. I think Musk announced that they were going to remove blocking as a feature. Mm -hmm. um, which is just, I, I won't get down that rabbit hole because I will <laughs> rant forever. Um, and so, you know, you have these sort of diametrically opposed reasons why, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not taking down enough content versus you're taking down too much content um, of the stuff that I like. Uh, and so, and somehow, somehow this all manifests as we need to reform Section 230. Um, now, there are, I think, you know, I, I certainly have some objections to the way 230 has been instantiated um, because it has, has tended to creep a little bit um, against things like products liability. Um, so there was a, a case called Herrick v. Grinder, um, which was a, a situation where um, uh, a, a, an individual who was using the platform Grinder as a dating app um, had a an ex turned stalker who proceeded to post under this victim's name on Grinder, saying like, "I enjoy rape fantasies." Come and assign. basically using that to target this individual. Um, and 230 immunized Grinder. Uh, Grinder did not not cover itself in glory in, res in responding to this. They did not respond particularly promptly. They were kind of dragging their feet about banning these accounts. Um, and 230 immunized them from that. And so there were uh, there was an attempt to sue them under the theory of products liability, saying the way you've designed your product is fundamentally defective and dangerous because of the effect that it can have on your users. And that was knocked out of court saying, like, doesn't matter, 230 precludes any kinds of products liability claims. Um, and so it started to creep into this sort of absolute where, like, well, in, in the minds of some folks, like, we're not liable for anything that goes on on our platforms, and we don't necessarily have a duty to address it. Um, and so there are, but it, this all gets tossed into the big messy on? slot bucket of people having problems with 230. Um, so fast forward to modern day, and there are a pair of cases that came up at the Supreme Court this past term, um, and they are they are paired together. They actually got paired together at the Ninth Circuit level, uh, and that's Tamna v. Twitter and Gonzalez v. Google. So they kept the alliteration, which was nice, it made it easy to remember. <laughs> Uh, and the basic fact pattern was, I, I 
don't think it came out of the exact same fat pattern. No. No. So why don't you talk about the, the fat patterns? Okay. Um, so I'm going to get them wrong. Okay. So the fat pattern for Gonzalez versus Google is that um, I think it was a young woman who was killed in one of the terrorist attacks that took place in Europe. In Paris. Um, in Paris. Um, and she obviously, it was an ISIS um, related situation and her family or the estate, I think, her her estate sued Google on the grounds that the um, people who conducted this terrorist attack had um, basically been radicalized by the videos that they had seen on YouTube because of the way YouTube's algorithm and recommendation engine worked. And that was something that Google could have control over and chose not to have control over because not only, I mean, they do take down the videos if you report them, but it doesn't stop the algorithm engine from recommending things that they haven't taken down. And if you have watched certain videos and they take them down, they theoretically could put up a pop-up or a banner or an ad in front of things to try and de-radicalize you, and they don't. So there are decisions that Google could have made and did not make, and that was basically all sort of bundled together in the reasons behind why the estate conducted this lawsuit. And um, do you want to cover the Twitter one a little bit? It was vaguely similar, but it was um, not so much the algorithm um, recommendation process, because of course Twitter at that point was very different. Um, but it was related to um, terrorist-related bomb-making information and things like that. Yeah, it that was, was being shared on, on Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, and it was it was against Twitter and a, a handful of other social media companies. But Twitter was the one that ended up on the caption, and I think was the primary um, recipient of the complaint. But it was it was exactly what Heidi said. It was you know there's this availability of information relating to terrorism and terroristic activities that is available on these platforms, and uh, there should be, so the, the levels, there were sort of two levels to the complaint, and this ended up being actually very important for the way the decision played out. Um, the first level was uh, that these companies have, under anti-terrorism statutes, aided and abetted terrorism. Um, by virtue of, in YouTube's case, it's a recommendation algorithm and failing to, uh, you know, take down content uh, and failing to somehow design their algorithm in a way that either did the pop-ups or removed the radicalizing content from the algorithm. Um, and in the case of Twitter and some of these other platforms, just failed to act expeditiously or sufficiently to crack down on these networks. And then by failing to do that, they had aided and abetted terrorism. Um, now, Section 230 is a defense. Uh, and so the way that the courts approached this was essentially, and everyone looked at this and thought, oh my god, it's a 230 case, because 230 tends to like suck up all the oxygen of the room that it is in. Um, and there were a lot of concerns that this was a case that was going to be decided on 230 grounds. It's sort of been one of the first really big 230 cases in, in a little bit. Um, and the risk of a case being before the Supreme Court on 230 grounds isn't even so much that the Supreme Court would declare it unconstitutional. I mean, there was some concern about that, but it was also the concern that various justices, um, including but not limited to Clarence Thomas and occasionally Sam Alito, uh, put things in their dicta that three and five and seven years later, they say, oh, previous dicta in dissents of the Supreme Court has said X, Y, and Z, which has since been quoted by courts of appeals, and now we're going to turn it into the ruling and say that it's you know long been discussed by commentators and therefore now we're in, now we're in you know xyz land and there was concern that that might manifest which would be bad for <coughs> future lower court appellate court and supreme court processes because there are some courts at this point fifth circuit that are interested in quoting dissents as if they were rulings they're not yeah. Um, and the Supreme Court, you know, Thomas has been very upfront, which is ironic because he actually wrote the decision in Tampa. Um, and it was a reasonable decision. Stop. <laughs> Get my pace marker <laughs> up to speed. Um, 
but he has a tendency to, yeah, to essentially lay out dissents where he basically says things like, I think we should just abolish Section 230, and um, we should throw out New York Times v. Sullivan altogether, and just truly, um, I think the legal terminology for it is buck wild, uh, <laughs> takes on, on First Amendment related issues in particular. Um, and, and then retcons. Can you elaborate on New York Times versus. Um uh, the one you just oh, so New York to. Times v. Sullivan uh, sets out defamation standards for public figures and basically says, uh, if I'm remembering, I'm racking my brain back, uh, but it's essentially, Heidi is glimmering like you have the answer. Go for it. Okay, so, um, how does a bastard orphan son of a whore and a Scotsman manifest the law that eventually becomes New York Times versus Sullivan? Well, the reason we have New York Times versus Sullivan is because and Alexander Hamilton um, represented somebody in a case in New York State that set the tone for all defamation law since. Um, the ruling issued after he passed and in his memory because he was right, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the New York Court of Appeals said, unfortunately, something being correct, like factually correct, is not a defense right. to defamation law because that's the way the British have always done it, but we are a new country with a new perspective and we should come up with a new law where truth is a defense and now it is. So that's one ele element of Times versus Sullivan. The other element of it is if you are a public figure and something is not true, it has to be either you know that it's wrong and you're maliciously saying it anyway or you're, you suspect that it's wrong and you're saying so without doing the proper research. But that only applies to public figures. So I'm going to take that one right there and run with it. That right there is something that I see in social media that is happening constantly, where we have public figures defaming other public figures with statements that are categorically untrue. They'll use naming, false naming, say things that are completely just bonkers and yet nothing seems to happen it just is a constant whirlwind and then they'll use 230 as their thing and say oh it's okay because the internet gives me the right to say whatever or first amendment rights give me the right to say whatever i want to say as long as i'm not saying fire in a crowded yeah, theater yeah so there's so where do we so where do we stop false information from continuing I'm not saying that we should have a council of this is right and this is wrong, but there should be a line where we have, in a, and I know I'm talking utopia here, but there should be a line here where somebody can't just consistently keep saying something that is absolutely <laughs> erroneous and still continue to say it, even if it's on the internet and even if it is First Amendment in question. So there, there's actually a couple of really interesting things in there. One is, you know, so the idea behind New York Times v. Sullivan is in part this idea that if you become a public figure, so if I am a private figure and somebody says something about me that is just categorically false, um, it is a lot easier for me to sue and win on a defamation case. Um, if I am a public figure, the idea that the law sort of holds is, well, you have voluntarily exposed yourself to greater scrutiny. Um, you know, you sort of put yourself out there as a topic of conversation, and there's some degree to which you just have to accept that people are going to say some wild stuff occasionally. Um, and, you know, we don't want them to say things that are outright malicious or things that they know are false, um, but, you know, you kind of have to take a little bit of, you have to be a little bit more of a punching bag. Um, the, the repeated false statements thing is actually very interesting um, because one of the things that we have seen, obviously, is that it's um, really gotten into the mainstream media in a very large way. So the previous election, I think, was like the real testing ground for like how much garbage can you just repeat over and over and over again mm -hmm. and not get called out for it. Um, which is why the Smartmatic voting machines lawsuit has been a real hoot to watch. <laughs> Um, because, you know, they actually, I, and I think, listen to the podcast Serious Trouble, uh, which is Ken White and Josh Barrow. They did a phenomenal, uh, they followed this whole saga as it was going. Um, and I think a lot of the legal world was really upset when this didn't go to trial, because 
like, good God, we wanted to see some of these emails so badly. Um, and they ended up settling. But it was a proof of concept that there are situations where you can hold, you know, the traditional media, which has historically been a, a very, very strong bastion of First Amendment protection. There are, there is a point at which a court will very seriously consider the argument that they knew they were spouting nonsense and they continued to do it anyway. Um, you know, now granted, that took discovery, that took getting access to the internal emails at Fox, where they were literally saying, we know this is nonsense and we're saying it anyway. Um, you know, and like Rudy Giuliani going off the script, which, God bless. Uh, and now he's been found liable. Again. Um, but there are, you know, the chickens are coming home to roost. We're in the FO stage of the FAFO procedure, um, which is very satisfying to watch. Um, but to get back to Twitter v. Tamna, so there are Twitter v. Tamna, Gonzalez, Google. So these were consolidated um, at the Ninth Circuit, and then at, at the Supreme Court they were argued separately but considered at the same time, I think. Um, it was a very, it, procedurally it was kind of hinky for the Supreme Court. Um, but essentially what happened was there were sort of two stages of proceedings. The first, or of the argument. The first was this, did these, did this failure to more adequately crack down or, uh, you know, de-emphasize or remove from the algorithm terroristic speech constitute aiding and abetting under anti-terrorism laws? That was question one. And then question two was, if so, is Section 230 a defense of that? And I think everyone saw 2.30 and their hair got on fire because that is the very, again, Thomas had said some wild stuff about 2.30 in dissents, and we were like, oh no, oh no, oh no, um, this is it, this is the vehicle for that crazy stuff to become law. Um, but the court actually just said we didn't even need to get to that. They did the first stage of the question, of, is this aiding and abetting? And the answer is no, um, that failure to act under these sets of circumstances particularly, is not aiding and abetting. And there was a very long discursive, like very, you know, current law students, uh, anybody who's gone through law school can appreciate the long, like, here is historically what aiding and abetting has meant, according to every 1L uh, who's ever taken a criminal law course, I uh, can tell you vaguely the contours of aiding and abetting, and this ain't it, essentially. Um, and that aiding and abetting does not necessarily impose a proactive duty. Uh, on a, on a uh, platform, in this case, extrapolating the principles of aiding and abetting doesn't magically create a proactive duty on the like beyond what they're already doing on the part of these platforms. And this was thing; these were things that the platform knew existed. So it's you know they knew the IP addresses, they knew the kinds of accounts, they knew the kind of language that was being used in the posts and on the websites that were manifesting within the algorithm. So it's not that they weren't aware of the situation, it's that that mere degree of awareness did not manifest a, you know, tent of responsibility. So I would ask the question this, if a car manufacturer markets their vehicle and we find that the car has a defect and they do, are they not responsible for doing a recall? These terrorists marketed their thing out into the public and there was a action. Are they not liable? So I'm going to not really, it's not a devil's advocate thing, but it's sure. sort of a different twist on that perspective. Um, is it marketing by its nature to put a statement on the internet? I think it depends on the information that's being right. disseminated. Because they weren't, they weren't like, buying Google ads for this. They weren't okay, putting fair. it, they weren't They weren't even hashtagging it for it to show up. There may have been some SEO in there on the web pages, but they weren't, they weren't buying space for this to be advertisements. This wasn't a situation where, you know, this is 1992 and they're trying to buy uh, lowest rate ads because somebody is running for office to show their two hour long anti-abortion film during prime time, which was what was happening in 1985 and 1992 and 1996 um, before the Fairness Doctrine completely was obliterated. So the, you know, trying to sort of draw that line between marketing and putting your violent perspectives online without giving specific instructions for what to do about it is the line that we're sort of looking at. 
Gotcha. And these, you know, these videos and this content was radicalizing people to have a certain perspective, but what they chose to do about it was not in the contents of these specific videos. Yeah, sort of along the line of the fact that the anarchist cookbook is still legal to purchase mm -hmm. within the scope of the United States. Uh, you know, it's this idea between, it's the distinction between the dissemination of ideas and then acting upon those ideas. And historically, under the law, the idea of acting upon those ideas, the liability is attached to the person who does the acting rather than the person who puts out the dangerous information. Now, this does create, you know, this is, this is a tension that has existed throughout American, and I believe English, though I can't speak all the way to the history, common law for centuries. Like, we have always grappled with this. Um, and now we're grappling with it in the context of people getting doxxed or swatted. You know, putting out information that is public, my address is out there. Um, you know, the Washington Post publishes real estate purchases on their website uh, in, within the area. You can find my address if you look, it's not hard. Um, people use that to call in, you know, if someone uses that to call in a swatting threat, this becomes a real issue. Um, if someone republishes that on Kiwi Farms, is that, uh, is that itself creating liability or is it the person who picks up the phone and calls in a swatting threat? And this is like, we, we you know, we have an answer to this legally, but it's, you know, that's not to say that it's not one that we're constantly kind of trying to reassess how good we feel about that answer, um, because it continues to present challenging questions like this. So there's workarounds for things like that. Like, if you believe that you're likely to be the victim of a swatting situation, which is where somebody um, fakes an IP address or fakes a phone number and calls 911 or the police and says there's, you know, someone in danger or someone with a gun or whatever and the SWAT team comes in. If you believe that there is a risk for that, then there are now lists in a lot of larger communities that you can put yourself on and you'll have to show an ID, you have to validate yourself in some way and they they will put a stopgap in place before a swatting situation happens either on you know local or federal level so it allows people to have this absolutely violent rhetoric and threat and collaboration situation which you could sue them for if you actually catch them mm -hmm. while giving a tiny tiny bit of support for somebody who feels like they may be in that kind of a situation. Yeah, I mean, so we, it's, it's kind of, it's a little disappointing because the, the case is actually relatively straightforward. Um, procedurally, the way that they decided these were they decided on Twitter v. Tamna, um, which was the question of, you know, e this isn't aiding and abetting. And then released a three-page decision for Gonzalez v. Google, which is said essentially in accordance with our decision that we released today, Twitter v. Tamna. This is now remanded, so bye. It was um, a very scary forty-five minutes in between the release <laughs> of the. Two and everyone cases. went to the Gonzalez one, and they're like, "Crap, I gotta read the Twitter decision." <laughs> Switched over to the other PDF and started reading that one frantically. It was the last good day for two thirty law Twitter, I think. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, I'm still mourning the loss of like legal Twitter. It's like slightly reconstituted on Blue Sky, and there's like some of it on Mastodon, but yeah, haven't, haven't quite gotten it back up. Okay. So I mean, it's it's only 10:36. We got plenty of time. Happy to spitball, ask questions, talk First Amendment. We can talk about my favorite Star Trek series. We can just go on. Sure. Well, I'm always up to talk about Star Trek, but this is perhaps <laughs> slightly far. Can you come up to the? Up to the mic. Wait, we're here. So much effort. Um, it's on. not on. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> oh. There we go. Ah, but now, yep, that's very on. <laughs> we're back here. Blow your hair back. Yeah. Um, this is perhaps ever so slightly a field, but um, you mentioned that the, in that Alexander Hamilton case that the uh, common law that they were using at the time. Uh, so, not, so not to make you responsible for knowing common law that was abrogated in the United States 250 years ago, but uh, that truth was not a defense for defamation in the, the, the British common law. What possible defenses are there? Be like That seems like the obvious baseline and then, you know, other things. What, poss what was going on? Um, I mean, I think it goes to, you know, a lot of 
the idea of certain people in the UK being above the law. Um, and that being a method of protecting those who did not want, you know, certain information being disseminated, obviously not necessarily even publicly, like, in a wide scope, but, you know, just in correspondence to people and things like that. And it's, you know, it's part of the reason why certain, you know, even more recent litigation, like Elton John has won some defamation claims. Um, J.K. Rowling um, on some pre, I don't know, pre-evilness issues. Um, also won on a couple of uh, defamation and invasion of privacy claims involving her ex-husband. And there are, like, there are books that have been banned in the UK because obviously they don't have, they, it's not that they don't have a First Amendment, they don't have an equivalent. There isn't a constitutional freedom of speech. There isn't even a you know nationwide freedom of speech. Scotland has a couple little quirky things that are closer to the US on that. And if they ever manifested independence, they probably would have it closer to us than what it currently is. But those are a number of the reasons, you know, behind all this. It doesn't all go back to like the Star Chamber and, you know, the Magna Carta and things like that, but it's certainly grounded in it. And yet another reason to support Scottish independence. <laughs> Let's go. I think popular desire is all you need for that. Um, thank you. And that, that does that, that makes sense. Britain having their wibbly wobbly liberty liberty pretend constitution. That, yes. uh, a lot of problems there. I'm going to use that phrase for now. <laughs> but also, I'm just going to throw something out here. If the Scots do manifest um, full separation, mm -hmm. There is a very strong risk that their moral rights are going to be more like France uh, than the UK. Yeah. And France, um, speaking completely so off the top Moral of the rights theory, in the context of intellectual property rights, yeah. by the way. That's Which is basically a copyright to. issue. In France, if somebody has been dead for, I don't know, four, six, seven hundred years, you still have to um, credit them as the author or creator of the work that you are basing a transformative work on, which is why in France there is very large mention of Victor Hugo on all of the Les Miserables posters, less so in other countries. Hmm. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I, I think, Meredith, when you were talking about previous cases, mm -hmm. the dissent put little tidbits in that were used later on by Justice Thomas. Was there anything in these two decisions, in the dissents, that might come up in the future? No, I actually... Unless, you know, I know Congress can change the law. I think these were 9-0. I think these were unanimous decisions. Um, there were concurrences. Um, I know Jackson wrote a concurrence, um, at least in Tamna. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think there were any dissents in this one. I think the, the Supreme Court for... Uh, the Supreme Court, um, the way they operate is usually, you know, when you show up and you present a case at the Supreme Court and they agree to hear it, you have to phrase it basically as a lone question. It's like one very short paragraph. That is the question presented. Um, now, in theory, that is to limit the scope of how sprawling they can get with the inquiry. Uh, in practice, what happens is the Supreme Court usually answers the question they wished you'd asked. <laughs> um, and so they can go, and they, they're not limited, but they can go wherever a field they feel like going. Um, and as we, recently seen. as we have very recently seen. Um, I'm just having war flashbacks to our Warhol v. Goldsmith conversation. Um, so yeah, they, uh, no dissents on this one, um, but they do often, you know, they are very known for um, retconning. Their, their dicta and saying like, well, this is dicta. Well, actually, no, it was never dicta. It was always actually part of the decision. Um, so we, we do see that happen somewhat frequently. Hi, what were those last two terms? Dicta? And the other one. Retcon. Retcon? Uh, oh. Retcon is um, where you try to retroactively manifest a different continuity for something. So it's a term that comes from like TV from shows. Fanish activity, yeah. yeah. Yeah, from yeah, basically TV shows because movies didn't do it as much, um, but also books. So like, let's say for 
let's say for example you're Arthur Conan Doyle and you kill off Sherlock Holmes and you have to retroactive, retroactively re-manifest the continuity so he's still alive. That's a retcon. Yeah. JK, we didn't actually kill him off. Um, or uh, Star Trek does this quite a bit. I mean most of the new, like the Gorn in the new, uh, new Star Treks are actually kind of terrifying, whereas the Gorn in the original series were just a guy in a lizard suit that Kirk punched. Um, yeah, so they've retconned kind of what the Gorn do. Um, dicta is the legal term for the bits of the opinion, of a legal opinion, that aren't actually binding. They're not, the, they're not the actual binding decision, it's just kind of the discourse that the judges will engage in around the margins. Um, you know, there are witticisms, which they think they have a lot of, and, um, you know, the examples that they hold up, those aren't actually binding, but they are part of the discussion, and so they're called dicta. Um, usually you only talk about dicta when you're trying to argue that this part is actually not the important part of the decision, um, but they will often take these sort of throwaway comments and then be like, actually, no, that was really important. Would you say that the debate between Kagan and Sotomayor in um, Warhol versus Goldsmith, other than being really depressing, um, manifests as dicta? Or is it just stuff we really wish didn't exist? I think the latter. Okay. Yeah. I guess. Thank you. So, since we have the time, it seems like over the past 40 years, the idea of precedent and stare decisis is getting much weaker. Um, that, oh, uh, what is the woman who retired? Oh, goodness. Who Reagan appointed? Sandra Day O'Connor. Sandra Day O'Connor. She seemed to be in the forefront of weakening all of that stuff. And so when it comes to all of the 230 decisions that have been made, what are the chances that that, it, that, that established precedent is, as you just said, just kidding. Um, yeah, it, it's, you know, that always, historically, over the trajectory of the Supreme Court, that's always sort of come and gone in waves. Um, this idea of, like, we're really bound, you know, our hands are tied and incrementalism versus just throwing the whole thing out and saying this actually doesn't apply to our modern day. Um, and it really kind of comes down in a lot of cases, not really to party affiliation so much as whether or not a given justice is an institutionalist. So, like, Chief Justice Roberts is very much an institutionalist. He is all, you know, current news about his colleagues' travel plans, notwithstanding, um, is, you know, pretty, pretty very clearly believes in the institution of the Supreme Court and, like, maintaining its dignity and kind of shielding it from from getting, you know, expanded too much. Um, and so he's very concerned about like, you know, well, we, we have the precedent that we have before us and we kind of have to work within that. And he gets a little bit of heartburn. Like if you read his decisions, he's, he gets a lot of heartburn from some of the bigger stuff, um, you know, that people come in swinging from the margins for things. Um, and this is, you know, again, this is not new. Um, I think you can read, there are very competent histories that go back through the history of the Supreme Court, all the way back to like, even prior to the Civil War, um, you know, there were decisions around slavery and that were huge impetuses for, for the Civil War. Um, but really in the modern day, it was kind of the transition between the Warren Court and the Burger Court. Um, it was like one of the really high, high marks for the Warren Court um, in the 1960s was, you know, uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, it was a real, watershed moment for a lot of like civil rights decisions. Um, and that sparked a conservative backlash about saying like, well, you guys are just throwing out all this precedent. Like, what are you doing? You're, you're, this is an activist court. Um, and then you got the Burger Court, which kind of like started walking a lot of this back and entrenched itself. And it, it goes through these ebbs and flows um, over time. And you know, it's not necessarily tied to particular developments in the law so much as just kind of societal tides. So then what are your hopes for 230 precedents surviving? Um, I think because of what we saw this year, we don't, well, and also what, what is in the um, pipeline for being decided next year involving 230, which is zero. Um, and nothing seems to be coming up the pipe behind that either, although obviously that could change. Um, I think that we're in a situation right now where depending on who wins the presidency next, is going to have a significant impact on this. And I don't expect anybody to 
from either party, frankly, um, to be completely open if they're questioned about it during a uh, confirmation hearing, just because the nuances of every situation, or the nuances of every situation, every different kind of platform are going to remain different. Like 230, I don't think will ever be completely removed, A, because the tech lobbies are a little bit too significant, and B, platforms like Amazon and PayPal and Yelp all take advantage of 230 and removing it from those kinds of platforms where it's been in use for 25 years I think would be too significant a sea change and also too much of a risk of damaging US um, prominence in connection with you know the internet in a lot of ways of the English language internet the non-Chinese language internet it's very based in the US um, the platforms all host content here and believe me Europe has tried through the GDPR to take control of what they can take control of and there are ways where they have manifested that perspective on a wider basis like US privacy policies and we could talk about California and some of its insanity if we want to um, US privacy policies have incorporated a lot of the elements of the GDPR, even if it's not necessarily required. We don't have a federal privacy law. So I don't think there's going to be a situation where 230 disappears across the board. There may be some incursions on it on platforms where the content creation is more um, reviewable, especially as AI becomes more of a force in reviewing that content. But I don't think it's ever going to disappear because Amazon and PayPal and Yelp and Travelocity and every company that relies on reviews does, does not want that to happen. Yeah, and I think it's also just important to keep in mind that the, um, there's sort of two, I mean, there's two major trajectories for change in the law. One is going through the court system, which as Heidi pointed out, that takes a long time and you usually can look down the pike and get a good sense of like in the next three years, like, and often usually longer from inception. So the Google v. Oracle case, which made two trips up toward the Supreme Court, bounced back down and then came back up again, it took 10 years. It went for over a decade by the time it was finally resolved. And that was two tech giants with infinite money, uh, Scrooge McDuck swimming pools of cash, and they were just duking it out until they felt satisfied. Um, but usually you've got a few years of headway that you can look down and get a sense of where the where the movement is coming from, whether there are threats to the jurisprudence, what the vehicles are, etc. Um, more chaotic and marginally less predictable is Congress. Um, emphasis on chaotic. Uh, that is really where, if there's going to be any change coming in the next few years, it's going to come out of Congress. Um, we had a panel on Earn It and Stop CSAM, which are two bills right now that are the sort of biggest 230 related bills um, that have to do with, uh, they are formulated as attempts to, um, to crack down on um, CSAM childhood and sexual abuse material. Um, what they really end up doing is way, 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 way beyond that um, and do things like mandate encryption backdoors, um, which you can't, as someone, someone on that panel put it, um, you either have encryption or you don't have encryption. It's like being pregnant. You can't be a little pregnant. <laughs> you either are or you aren't. So you either have encryption or you don't. Um, and so uh, that's where we're seeing a lot of these um, pushes come through because, again, the rallying cry of we need to reform Section 230 is a bipartisan rallying cry for completely different reasons. Um, and, you know, things like um, sex trafficking, which is how we got sesta Fosta, um, was a very sympathetic header to put on 230 reform because you also, just as a political reality, don't want to be seen as the guy <laughs> arguing against something to fight sex trafficking. Like, what are you, pro-sex trafficking? Um, and if you're a sex worker, the unfortunate reality is that most many Congress careers don't consider you to be a human being. So like, coming in and arguing that this is going to hurt us, the answer is usually, oh no, and occasionally good, um, coming from Congress. So you know, it is. It's we see a lot of this framing. Um, you know, it's an echo of what happened with the Communications Decency Act about we need to protect the children who are going into this like weird and unknown space that most of the adults don't even understand at this point. Uh, and you can get, uh, I don't remember who said it, but there was a famous line about, 
if the internet is destroyed, it's going to be a dual force of copyright and child pornography that, that is what eventually brings the hammer down. Um, so it's, this is something that we see over and over again. Keep an eye on Congress. Don't, don't trust it. Hi, it's me again. Hello. Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned Star Trek. The question we all need to ask, of course, favorite uh, Star Trek legal episodes, like Married oh. for Man, Ad Astra for Aspera, others. I you know, actually, I literally the trial like of Q, right? The, right. Yes. Yes. Far point, right? yes. That Judge Q. <laughs> um, I liked Ad Astra for Aspera actually quite a bit. I thought that was a very worthy heir to the genre of the trial episodes. Measure of Man, obviously classic. Um, I don't think Lower Decks has done a trial episode. Well, no, they. I guess they kind of did a trial episode, except it turns out it wasn't a trial. That was the punchline at the end. Um, but yeah, I would go with that Astra for Asper. Which episode was that? That was Strange New Worlds trial episode in season two. Um, I don't particularly have a favorite. My husband could probably answer for me, uh, which I don't normally say. Um, but I will say that my favorite uh, TV episode involving trials this past year, or, you know, TV-esque episode involving trials this past year was uh, season two of Schmigadoon, Schmigago. <laughs> um, how do you see AI affecting copyright? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. This is just, a little, no. just seven, a little small. Seven thing. minutes. Yeah, right. I was going to say, how much? Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> uh, I mean, as of now, if something is entirely created by AI, you can't register it with the Copyright Office, which means you can't sue for somebody infringing on it. So you're fine to create it, you're fine to distribute it, nobody's trying to stop you. But, well, I mean, other than the people whose works you use to combine into it who will sue you for uh, creating a derivative work without permission, um, assuming it's not in the public domain, uh, Mickey Mouse, January 1st. Um, <laughs> but if you create it, your opportunities to be the sole exploiter of it are massively, massively diminished for something that's 100% created by AI, which reduces the incentive for the TV networks and the film studios to create something that is entirely AI and distribute it because there's no restrictions on other people throwing it up on YouTube and monetizing it because you don't have any, you have you may have a copyright in it um, or you may try to claim copyright in it, but you don't have the ability to register and without the ability to register you can't sue. Um, there is one little thing that I would just want to throw into the universe for y'all and anybody watching involving AI and that is there are uh, troll entities that create images that are entirely created by AI. If you see a typewriter with a single word typed out, or Scrabble tiles with a word, or a clipboard with a word scribbled across it, um, or a newspaper headline, those were all created by AI. They have all been put onto um, Google and other search engines and Flickr uh, with a Creative Commons early archaic not used anymore license. If you don't comply with all the terms of the license, the people who created that art will send you a nasty cease and desist letter and demand $20,000 from you. However, the interesting thing is they haven't registered any, A, they haven't registered any of this with the US Copyright Office, and B, if they try to, you can now have that registration attacked because it was created by AI and they're not allowed to have a registration for it. Therefore, they can't sue you in federal court. Therefore, they can't get any damages from you. So there's a couple of interesting, and I, I ended up on the AI beat specifically because of the copyright thing, because I'm the music licensing person at our office, and then the fake Drake song dropped several months ago, and then everybody suddenly worried about AI all the time and wanted to know how we can fight this menace. Um, so there's actually a couple of discrete areas where AI and copyright intersect. Some of them have answers already. Some of them are a little more interesting. Um, one is the question about data training sets and data training sets for AI that include copyrighted works. A lot of people are very upset to find that their work had potentially made its way into a data training set. Um, that is actively being litigated right now, um, so we will have something approaching a def more definitive answer, but it is pretty clearly from the summary of the facts of fair use right now, which is not a satisfying answer for a lot of people who are upset about their stuff being put in these training sets. So there is work right now among um, 
both the AI companies, the training groups, which are usually different entities, by the way. The data scrapers are usually not the actual companies training the AI, um, and artists and some other entities about creating metadata and tags. It's like a robots.txt, but it's just do not scrape specifically for the purposes of training AI data. So that's one thing happening. The other is this, this outputs question about like what do you do with copyright on the output side. So Heidi pointed out there's a, there is a solid doctrinal answer right now which the Copyright Office subscribes to, which is an AI-enabled work. Um, the only parts of an AI, in a, and I use AI-enabled because it, it captures the fact that there's a spectrum here. Like there is, you know, I push a button on Dolly and it gives me an image versus there are AI um, tools that are baked into Photoshop now, where I'm doing most of the work, but I will use an AI or algorithmic. The line between those two things is very wobbly linguistically right now. Um, and so there, these exist on a spectrum. And the Copyright Office and the correct doctrinal take on this is those parts which are created by a human being are eligible for copyright. Those things that are created by a machine are not eligible for copyright purposes. Now on a practical level, um, the Copyright Office currently has to just rely on people telling them which parts are to which, and they really don't want to be the ones to make that decision, and it's almost functionally not administrable on a practical level. So here's my spicy hot take, and you can take this one home. Um, registrability for copyright is, a, is a, a, a policy tool that is entirely within the ambit of Congress, and they can just decide, you know, if we're really worried about AI, like displacing creative workers in the field of script writing, we can just say, and, any, and they, they have the power to do this, you know what, if there's, a, if there's a script where the first pass was generated by AI, don't care how much you rewrite it, that just doesn't get copyright protection. Um, and just like, congratulations, you don't get to use cop like AI to generate your first pass scripts anymore, like mm -hmm. Hollywood. Uh, which is actually the, the core of the debate right now with the writer's strike. Um, they are fighting the AMPTP, which are the major studios, uh, about many, 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 many things. But the AI component specifically uh, in the writer's context, and again, the actors also have their own AI issues going on, um, but the, the fight right now for the writers is that there's multiple stages of script writing, and there's different pay rates associated with each stage. So the first pass is the highest paid stage of script writing. If you're hi hired on to do a first treatment for a script, that's the highest pay rate that you can get. Then they will sometimes bring on other writers to do punch up or polish and revisions. That is a much lower pay rate. And so what writers are concerned about is that they're going to use that first pass is going to be done by AI, and then all the human writers are only going to be brought on at that lower polish rate. Um, and then it's just going to drive writers out of the business. So that's, it's an ongoing debate, obviously. Um, but yeah, it is. It does intersect in a lot of kind of wild ways. So, following up with that, if you can't copyright an AI work, can there be liability, a, a tort attached to AI work? Because if you can't copyright it and you can't monetize it, how could you tort it? Well, because the person who's putting all of that together is still engaging in some sort of an action and this is again the question of what is in the data set and if you're creating a data set on your own and then putting it into some sort of a blender to do a thing then you're the one who's responsible for whether or not the follow-on work is a derivative work uh, which means it's infringing or a transformative work which means it's probably not but then shouldn't, if it's a transformative work, shouldn't you then be able to remunerate yourself from that? Well, it depends because if you got the content that you are putting into the blender by removing watermarks or by engaging in copyright infringement by cracking a DRM in a way that's not permitted under right, the exceptions. But that's, right, but that's you've shown clear initiative action. There. Right. But say I create a, a program, uh, a macro, that writes an AI and, and the program itself publishes it. And that AI then defames, oh, say Mitch McConnell, just for fun. <laughs> he can't say anything back anyway. <laughs> Too soon. Oh, 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 oh. Um, As a registered lobbyist, I have no comment on this. <laughs> um, 
should should McConnell be able to sue? The AI did all the work. The AI itself published it. I think if if I can't copyright it, he can't sue me either. No, he could because um, it depends on what you're putting into the data set again. So depends on how you're creating whatever macro this is that's pulling from other content to manifest something in a data set. However, um, and obviously if there's truth in it, he can't sue you anyway. Um, but separate and apart from all of that, um, things that are very clearly fictional, um, this is something that in the fandom community we have all the time with real person fan fiction. Um, something that is clearly fictional um, again, is not seen as defamatory because it's something that is a fictional piece. And you can talk about it within fandom, uh, real person fan fiction is specifically the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Um, going back, you know, to Alexander Hamilton, there's real person fan fiction that's won Pulitzers and Tonys um, and Grammys. And there is real person fiction that people post on archive of our own, uh, where you cannot post automatically, you have to post it manually, but still. Um, and a lot of it is about people who are widely known as public figures. Some of it is people is about people who are public figures in much smaller contexts, like bands that have, you know, a thousand followers on um, what platform are the are the kids using these days? TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> um, and you know, people who are, you know, TikTok famous or Tumblr famous. Um, and whether or not they are public figures in this specific niche area versus on a wider scale is a matter for defamation law that there are unclear but existing guidelines about. Thank you. Well, we are at time. Um, yay, thank you everyone for coming out on this Monday morning. I hope all of your travels are easy. Uh, please rate us on the Dragon Con. Uh, app, the more stars we get, the bigger room we can maybe have next year. <laughs> Definitely get the 200 plus room for the generative AI and chat GPT stuff. Oh my yeah. god. Yes. That was a hell of a first panel for me to show up for. I was like, all right, first panel, let's go. And it was like they were turning people away. I was like, this is going to be the most packed year. <laughs> well, we're technically 100 people in here. There was 118 when I said, no, you can't go in. Right. People were going out and they're like, I just was in there. Nope, can't let you back in. Woof. And I turned away at least 65 out the door. So. Man, all AI all the time. Yeah. I imagine you guys can fill it. That'll be next year for ATSC. Oh my god. <laughs> From your right. lips to God's ears. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of suspect this is going to be like...